Because if you get the recruiting part right and you get the right people in the door, the rest of it's kind of easy. Why? Because this is not normal in private equity. It needs a decent this, needs this, needs an X.0, whatever. Why do you not feel that that is relative to the person's success? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Raw Selection Private Equity Podcast. Joining us today is Sam Adams, Managing Director of Talent at Berkshire Partners. This is an absolute super podcast. Of course, I would say that it's all about talent, but Sam is going to share with us the insights into cultural elements of, of growing and developing within a private equity firm, how they're hiring outside of the traditional private equity models and developing programs to invest in their people, but also a huge insight into their talent selection and search process and some things that will shock you and will be, hmm, that's not traditional, but it seems to be working for them. So buckle in. This is a great one. I've super enjoyed it. And there's some top recommendations as well at the end with regards to books and different bits and pieces. So thank you very much, Sam, for coming across. Thank you very much to Berkshire Partners for allowing Sam to, to come in and share a lot about the culture and about what you're doing for us all to learn from. Of course, I would say that talent's an incredibly important asset of any business and any organization, especially that of private equity, where we're dealing with multiple businesses. So let's jump in and work out what Berkshire Partners is doing to grow their firm and hire between eight to 10, just on the associate side per year, but also additional hires from there as well with across the firm. Sam, if you could give us a 60 to 90 second breakdown of you, please. Absolutely. And thanks for having me, Alex. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have a little bit of an unusual background um, for the role I have now, which um, I'll share. I actually started my career in advertising um, and I went to business school as one of two people from advertising out of 900, having never read an income statement or balance sheet um, or anything of that nature. I, I graduated from business school, felt like I needed a PG year in business. So I went to Bain Consulting. Um, which was amazing, incredible firm, incredible experience, and then found my way back into marketing and branding, um, largely working for people I had worked for in the past, which is a bit of a theme in my career of choosing people um, and relationships uh, as a, a source of kind of career direction. And um, the Berkshire opportunity came up very serendipitously, Alex. I was the head of global branding for Bank of America, working for an amazing woman who's still a mentor of mine. And um, I was invited to a play date of, uh, this was probably 13 or 14 years ago, a friend from business school. Um, and we're, we're hanging out on a Sunday morning and the husband of my friend actually works at Berkshire Partners. And he said, would you ever consider this role of head of talent? And I said, yeah, I don't really think like HR talent is really want to be because frankly, I had never worked for an organization where it was a strategic capability. And he smartly said, oh, why don't you just come in and meet Jane Brock Wilson, who um, is another mentor legend in the industry, legend at Berkshire, and have lunch with her. And I came in for a one hour lunch. It turned into a three hour lunch where we think we talked about everything under the sun, Alex. Um, and at the very end of it, she said, I think you'd be really good at this job. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, and so that's how I made my way into this wonderful world of talent and I, HR. And um, I have three kids and I live outside of Boston. I have bees and chickens and a golden retriever and a husband and a very full life on top of it all. Loving that the husband came last. The bees, the chickens, <laughs> the dog. And I feel that way also, husband. yes. Exactly. Absolutely. Oh, thank you very much for having time. And obviously, anything talent, we're always excited to speak about any guest, of course, on the podcast, but certainly when we go down uh, uh, my passion of being uh, down the talent route. So, so what's one mistake that you see private equity firms making and what actions would you suggest to correct them? Yes. Um, you know, one thing I see, uh, one mistake I see private equity firms making is being narrow in their assessment of talent, Alex. Um, and I'm a great example of that myself. I came in to run, to be the head of talent, having never done private equity and never done talent or HR before. 
Uh, I came into the job thinking, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll just go do something else. And I uh, can't imagine the dialogues that were happening on on their side of it. But um, I'd say, you know, I think firms can, particularly on the investment side, if we think about early talent, associate talent, VP talent, are looking for people who have done the, you know, have done consulting or done investment banking or have done even a private equity analyst program before. And if you only look in those pools, it's a pretty narrow set of people to be looking at. And you've got a lot of firms fishing in the same pools. And in fact, I think what we've found is you can have amazing investors who don't necessarily come out of the traditional pool, candidate pools. Um, and so in terms of how I would um, remedy that mistake, would be really as, uh, thinking about assessing people based on their capabilities and their values and kind of their what they'll add to the investment process, and less on have they done this exact role before. You know, we've had we've recruited people who have military experience. We have people who come right out of um, consulting into a into a VP role who've been terrific for us. And and our view has been we can teach the modeling. We don't actually even give a modeling test when we hire people. We just try to hire really smart people who are hungry, who are good people, good commercial instincts, and we can train a lot of the fundamentals um, of the of the job. Yeah, big believer of that. Two things I look we look for here is high IQ, high conscientiousness. Um, which conscientiousness has two levels: orderliness, how organized they are, and of course how much they're prepared to work hard and do what they yes. need to do, which help drive success. So there's a few questions in that, because the first thing that I think about is, you know, if I was running a private equity firm, I think there's a skill gap there. You said you're training financial modeling, but they haven't grown up in that world. If they come out of the military, you know, M&A is going to be uh, fairly alien to the regards to process. How are you guys developing the talent then? What are you focusing around that in order to improve people and get them, you know, to being these superstars that, that you're saying they are? Yeah. Great question. And let me take a step back on that, Alex, because we actually have a four person team that I lead here at Berkshire whose sole responsibility is talent management at the firm, not the portfolio companies. And actually, we have a tremendous team that does HR um, and all things related to HR that that our team partners with them on, but we're not responsible for. So so our team of four is dedicated um, to attracting the right people, assessing, and then the learning and development piece of it, which we'll talk about among other things. Um, so in terms of like how you develop people, there are a couple of different ways we do that. So we just talk about the private equity side of the business. Um, we have, we're divided into industry teams. Uh, we talk about being a team of teams. So immediately there's a home for a person to uh, come into. One of the things we hire for, Alex, are people who are good at teaching and learning. That's a core value of the firm. So um, we have sort of natural uh, mentors and people who take a lot of pride into being, um, to apprenticing others. Um, and that happens largely in the industry team formula, in the trenches, in the deal teams. I mean, there's no substitute for uh, on the job kind of drinking from a fire hose experience. But that needs to be supported, obviously, right? So we do have um, kind of talent-driven uh, learning programs. So for example, a year or two ago, we had actually a pretty big uh, class of new VPs coming in and we set up a VP cohort. Um, so just of our, for us, a big class of VPs would be, you know, five or six new VPs starting in any given year. And we had a, a learning curriculum where that cohort could go to um, go through together every six or eight weeks. And we had some specific kind of training modules on how you lead teams, how you mentor others, how you show up as a leader, how you quarterback a deal. So some of some of those specific things. Um, we have an executive coaching program, Alex, which um I inherited uh, from my predecessor, um, Jane Brock Wilson, who put it into place. And it's it's really been tremendous where um, for our VPs and principals and our leaders at the firm, 
everyone has access to a third party executive coach after they've been with us um, for a period of time. So I think some some firms offer an executive coach when there's a problem. And certainly an executive coach um, can be very useful when there's a problem. But we look at it in terms of leaning into your strengths. And really, it's people's strengths who are at the end of the day are going to make money for our LPs. And so how do we take someone's strengths and accelerate them? And how do we shore up areas that need to be shored up? And sometimes working with a third party is just another way of um, accessing that. So that that's something that um, we offer. And we do mentorship and we do performance reviews and we can get into all of that. But we have a fairly robust way of sort of surrounding our people kind of throughout the firm to make sure that they're operating at their at their highest and best performance. Some of the question that comes out of that. But so we've we've got if we look at the the initial people coming in, you've basically got programs to train them and get them up to speed if they're well, if they are or they are not coming from what I regard as traditional private equity routes, investment banking, not so much in the US, but consulting is quite well used in Europe. Is that is that the case for that? Generally, people have to come in with some familiarity around what a model is. And they're not, we're, I, I want to be clear, we're not hiring people from sort of a zero base knowledge. It's not like me when I went to business school and I had never looked at an income statement or a balance sheet before. Um, so so there is sort of that that level. But in terms of how we get people to the level where they need to be, and by the way, this isn't just our non-traditional candidates. Sometimes people come from uh for quote unquote traditional areas, and they also need to get um, trained on sort of what a Berkshire model looks like and what a Berkshire standard of diligence looks like. And so we need to be able to support that. Um, so again, just to back up, we have, we're hiring for capability. We're hiring for the raw horsepower, the teacher and learner, the grit, fire in the belly, commercial instinct, you know, great relationship skills, all that needs to be needs to be true. Some familiarity and interest and passion around um, the the private equity side of the business and deal doing. And then we will support them with a a mentor, someone on their team who can really work with them on the finer points of modeling and diligence and things like that. Sometimes we'll have a third party come in, you know, and work, work with folks on the modeling. And then we've got training in place uh, that our own people will offer more of a structured training approach um, to also sort of pick up the sort of the broad skill set that people need to learn. Appreciate that. I'd anticipate that this comes down to culture and, and being built based on, we have a similar model here of investing in our people and, disproportionate investment is how we we coin the phrase. But the adaptation, I imagine, as people get more senior in the business of wanting training, development, mentorship, not so much offering, but actually receiving that. I think a lot of firms would probably struggle for that in private equity. If you were to say a principal, we're going to put you through a program of mentorship. And like, I don't want to mentor anyone. Like, no, no, you're going to be mentored to be better. And we're going to use an outside internal party. I think everyone wants to learn, but in a structured environment, how do you get the uptake? Is that purely down to cultural element of this is what we do, everybody does it? Um, have you had issues there with that kind of adaptation of I'm a principal, I don't need help, which is which is obviously rubbish, but a lot of people have that mindset. Is that something you've had a challenge with? And if so, have you got over it? Or is that down to the fact that the culture of the business sets that this is the standard and if you join us, this is what you do? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, Alex, because we really have, we that is not a problem that we have had. Um, and I do think it comes down to the type of people who are attracted to come to a place like Berkshire. Um, and then once you get here, the culture and the values of the place, which really is talent first and talent focused. I mean, I, I I feel like the luckiest talent person in the entire world that I get to work in talent at Berkshire Partners as a, as a managing director who has a seat at the table and I am the voice of culture and people and talent and that's respected. And again, I, um, you know, I was fortunate enough that, that Jane paved that path for me 
Um, so no, that is, that's not people kind of rejecting, um, being mentored or rejecting having to grow or, or that kind of thing. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't happen here. In fact, we have, we have development and training, um, or, or, or review discussions with our managing directors. Every year we go through a managing director development process. Um, that's a very robust 360 process where our most senior leaders are hearing, yes, the strengths that they're going to be leaning into, but also where they need to change. And in fact, Alex, our upward feedback for our managing directors is an open link for every person at the firm. So any anybody at the firm who has a suggestion for how one of our partners can be a better leader is invited to participate in that process. And we will share that feedback with our partners. That, I mean, that means you've got some strong leaders in the business. Uh, I, I cannot attest to how important that that aspect is and how culturally it has to be created. Um, it's also incredibly cost effective because it's free. Your people get to give you advice. Um, it's something we do here every month. Everybody sits down with me and tells me how good I am, hopefully, but also tells me how bad I am um, and does that with the managers on a weekly basis as well. So so that's fantastic. You've implemented that. Um, and obviously, that's been part of the culture prior to you joining and implementation of that. And that's phenomenal. The So just talk to us a little bit about those those reviews. What, what's you mentioned? Obviously, the, the upward feedback process. You mentioned three hundred and sixty reviews, which is a, a commonly used term. What, what what is actually involved in these reviews? What's being discussed? What's being shared? Um, and what's being assessed? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. We're actually in the midst of our uh, managing director development process at the moment. Um, so uh, so the process includes uh, a set of inputs that are. Um, anonymous. As I mentioned, there's upward feedback that's offered. There's peer feedback. So partners having a chance to share um, what they see about their partners. We do use in that feedback a survey mechanism. So there are a set of um, capabilities and qualities that we're asking people to opine on both upward and peer. That feedback all gets collected and then it gets shared with uh, myself and then the executive committee that runs that business. So we have a three person private equity committee uh, and a three person public equity committee. But if we're just focusing on private equity, um, that feedback, feedback gets shared, um, it gets discussed. We get a sort of a business overlay and how the committee is thinking about that partner and they take a look at the feedback. And then a summary is written where we talk about, you know, here's here's the message we want this person to hear. Here are all the strengths that we want you to continue to lean into. And here are a couple things that came up um, from a development standpoint to think about. And then it's a meeting, you know, where it's it's me plus one of our members of the private equity committee where we share that information with the person. And it's a very, I would say, kind of Socratic meeting with inquiry and curiosity and and again i'm fortunate to to work with partners who are like tell me more about that you know i want to of course and everybody wants to go right to their development areas probably in your organization too and i have to pause everybody and say hey, let's talk about the strengths because the strengths are really incredible and important to talk about and then we get in and and we bring you know curiosity to the um, development areas and have a dialogue about that that ends with kind of goals and here's how I'm thinking about future year and then the last piece that I think may be a little unusual to Berkshire but speaks to kind of the transparency of the partnership and how we think about development is we have the partners in each of our industry teams get together um, so if you have a three-person managing director team for one of our industry teams they'll get together with me and someone from our private equity committee, and they'll talk with each other about what they learned about their strengths and their development areas. And the dialogue is really around how can we help each other shore up our development areas in service of leading a really high performing team. And so um, there's a lot of uh, you know vulnerability and risk taking and sharing and trust among the partners to be able to have those really open and trans transparent dialogues with one another. 
Yeah, there's an author called Patrick Lencioni, who uh, I'm a big, uh, big, big advocate of his, and have read uh, nearly all his books. I mean, if anybody who's watching on YouTube will see them over my uh, left or right shoulder, depending on which way this uh, this screen p- permits itself. But a lot of his fundamentals around conflict, around um, heated discussions, around putting those areas in front of each other, uh, incredibly important. So it sounds like uh, either somebody's read Patrick Lencioni's or somebody's on the right track uh, of a similar route to uh, to him as well. Sorry to interrupt. Just a quick mention of our long-standing partnership with Grata. As you will probably know, the private equity scene is constantly evolving. And deal flow is moving now to proprietary and data-driven processes. Grata provides you with the data and information of over 7 million private companies. So if you're looking to improve your proprietary deal flow and improve the data access, then reach out to Grata today. Now back to the podcast. Return on investment is a is a big element with any business. I already know because we practice similar to you, Sam, with uh, Berkshire. But what are you what are you seeing as a return on investment above the investment that you're putting in people? It sounds like a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What are you seeing as that return on investment for your investing in your people up and down the scale, uh, depend, um, regardless of seniority? Yeah, well, I mean, listen, we we must believe in the return on investment because we've got a four person team who's fully dedicated to talent, finding the right people, developing them um, and all the other pieces associated with talent and culture. So what I would say is, you know, if we can um, get the right people in the right seats and bend the curve on their development as it relates to investment judgment, we are going to have a competitive differentiator. We'll be competitively differentiated in the marketplace. Um, We'll just get there faster. I think, you know, sometimes I'll say, Alex, um, and you might like to hear this, the most important thing that my team can do is help hire the right people. Because if you get the recruiting part right and you get the right people in the door the rest of it's kind of easy you know high impact players if you're successful in finding uh attracting finding hiring high impact players who work within your particular culture or berkshire you know internal berkshire's particular culture um there's not a lot more you need to do you know you can point high impact people in a certain direction and they will find a way to win and they'll find a way to uh, support and propagate the values of the firm. So in some ways, the most important thing I can do is help our teams find the right people. Well, I'm desperate to know, Sam. The thousands of people listening are desperate to know. Tell us about your attraction. Tell us about your selection process and let's see what we can learn from it. Oh gosh. Well, I, w- I wish I could tell you there were a silver bullet. Believe me, I've been looking for, for 12 years for a sil- silver bullet. And if you have one, um, I'd be happy to hear it. If we do, and I'll, I'm happy to speak about it. We do spend a bunch of time on ta- talent analytics and trying to understand what's predictive for us. Um, but I'd say, you know, it starts for us, Alex, with focus on the top of the funnel and just really making sure we have an incredibly uh, high quality top of the funnel. Um, and one that is, and we started the podcast talking about this, that's diverse, that in in diversity in terms of all the ways we measure diversity. Um, so it's a broad funnel, um, super talented. Um, and so, you know, we start with that and then we run our, um, candidates through an assessment process that we have iterated over time and some of the aspects of it, Alex are, you know, we use a a relatively tight team to meet with candidates over multiple cycles um, to really go deep with candidates. So I think, um, you know, a a mistake or a trap that some firms can fall into is almost like crowdsourcing an answer on a candidate. And you have, you know, 20 people meet with a person for a half hour, 45 minutes each, and everyone kind of talks about the same things. And, and they've gone kind of, you've gone a mile wide and an inch deep. And I think that is really, uh, you have a high likelihood of making a mistake in that process. So, so we've gone to a, a tight team with each candidate, multiple meetings. As we progress the candidate, we will, you know, expand the circle, get some different perspectives, give the candidate a chance to meet different people and, and understand if it's, 
if it's a fit. Um, so, and then that tight team will come up with, uh, you know, conviction that uh, we think this person's a great fit to the role. We do use a scorecard. And I think that's fairly um, typical. Our scorecard is as much um, capability based, as I mentioned, versus, you know, it's a little bit on kind of what's the experience that's relevant, but it's a lot of capability based. Um, and, and we, and we train our teams to, um, have a set of questions that they're, um, accustomed to asking. So you get a little bit of pattern recognition over time. Um, so just some, some best practices trying to, as best we can reduce bias that we know we all fight against just as humans in an assessment process. So, um, you know, references are a huge a uh, huge piece of it. We tend to do our references a little earlier in the process, Alex. So we may do our references and, you know, fifth, sixth inning with the person that can be tricky with, you know, you obviously can't um, speak to people if at the employer, if the person's gainfully employed, but um, a lot of times there are ways around that with, you know, people who have left an employer or prior employers or things like that. The references really give us again, a, a sense of kind of what are some other areas we can probe more deeply in. Um, and then we also have done, um, we use top grading. Um, are you familiar with the, the top grading process? So yeah, the book on it. Um, we will work with a top grading firm to um, kind of help us in the end stages. We don't, we don't use the top grading as like a red light, green light kind of higher, don't, higher. We don't, we do not outsource our judgment to our top grading partners, but we do use it as kind of a compendium of like a person's story all in one place that we can use to, to kind of finalize our, um, our judgments. Um, so that's the process we run through. And, um, you know, I think we, it, it, it takes time. That's the downside of our process. And, you know, when I, when I was hired, I think it was, you know, and maybe an eight month process, we, we try to do a little better than that these days. Um, but uh, it's it takes time, you know. You're really no no human is perfect, and so you're really uh, you're really making a judgment with imperfect information, using relying on a lot of pattern recognition and and um, on whether you think this person's going to be a good fit. And we get it we get it right a lot. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm interesting enough. I'm writing a book in the moment. It's on the portfolio talent side of things. I will do one on the private equity hiring as we also do that as a firm, but a lot of what you shared there is, you know, hiring committees basically is what I call it, you know, a niche group of people that are that are focused on it. Getting those people to ask questions around their skill set and their expertise and where they're comfortable rather than getting people that don't have that level to ask questions around things or just asking the same questions over and over again, which tends to be the case. You have seven partners all walk into a meeting. They all ask them a reason for leaving. They all ask them their experience and the can is drained at the end. And then the last person who goes in and goes, they weren't interested. They're not interested in working in. Yeah, because nine, seven people have all asked them why they want to work here. They've all asked them what the reason for leaving is. They've all asked them about their M&A experience. And it's just boring. So exactly right, some Alex. different bits and pieces in that. So yeah. that sounds like a pretty good um, selection process. You That process will have been developed, obviously, pre you joining, but with you joining. I'm interested to see and to hear what, what, have, what have you learned from what you've done? What have you tweaked recently? What have you changed recently? Have you gone into any, maybe not fundamental changes, some of it's just percentile changes, but is there anything that you guys have learned in your last uh, hiring session, the one before that you've, uh, that you'd like to share? Yeah. Um, we have, we have iterated and evolved over the years. I'd say the, um, the talent or the hiring committee, as you put it, that's a, that is something we have evolved into uh we have evolved our scorecard over the years based on just learning of of what is successful i will say just as an aside um you know the private equity business has changed and evolved in terms of um the the need for sourcing on the front end and really being an actor in developing deals and kind of that commercial instinct. Whereas, you know, when I first started, uh, a long time ago, it was, a it was in some part, there was, you know, receiving SIMs and putting a team together and you're kind of responding. Now we're very proactive as a firm. We're, we're in some cases years ahead of when 
an asset may ultimately trade. And I only mention that because that's a relatively, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively new capability that we're looking for in people, which is this ability to kind of proactively develop a deal. Um, you know, I'd say there are um, just some little nuggets we can point to. So, um, you know, when we look at, for example, scores, testing scores, GMAT, SAT scores like that, they're not really correlated with success. So example of kind of when you go back and you look at all your interviewing data over the years and and um, is there anything predictive in that? Interestingly, that was not something that is predictive. Um, I would say a trusted reference. Um, so really getting behind sort of how did that person show up in prior roles um, and how might that translate to this, whatever the particular role is at, at Berkshire and having a trusted reference, you know, if there's a relationship there, um, that's, that can be very um, predictive of success. But I wish I could say there was one question or one skill set that kind of was the silver bullet for finding amazing talent, but I have yet to I have yet to find that, Alex. Save yourself, Sam. There is no silver bullet. There's just good processes. <laughs> um, I mentioned this on the podcast before. I think it was Google that spent ten million or something on improving their interviewing process, and they still got it down to a flip of a coin. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, and that's Google, and they can hire whoever, whatever uh, they want in uh, in brand recognition. So there's two things you've mentioned now. I wanted to dive into. First one was origination. Um, out of interest, are you splitting your um, investment team from into a deal origination team and then you know deal execution team, or is is that skill set that you look for? People have to have both. People have to have both. Um, we do have a small team that's focused on business development and their, but their role is as much uh, teaching and, and helping our teams be really excellent at business development. We are not a uh, rainmaker organization where we're expecting, you know, a couple of people to source our deals. Interesting. And then the second question was with regards to the educational scores, uh, Gmat, you mentioned. Why... Because this is not normal in private equity. It needs a decent this, needs this, needs an X point or whatever. Why do you not feel that that is relative to the person's success? I mean, it's not a feeling, Alex. It's just, it's the fact of what, when we go back and we look at all of our data over the years, since we've been collecting data, interview data, and, and you know, our N isn't, we're not Google, you know, but we do bring in, um, you know, eight to 10 associates every year. So we, um, we can look at what, you know, what our interview data was, and we can go back and look at resumes and all these different things. Then we can look at how people ultimately perform. And sure, there are people with high test scores who perform very well. And there are people with, <clears throat> you know, normal test scores who also perform very well. And so, you know, I just think it's a bit of a red herring to 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 base your assessment process in any part on oh this person got you know perfect 800 on their gmat or whatever it is therefore they're going to be terrific at the job they might be terrific at the job but it doesn't necessarily mean that sort of whatever that whatever type of intelligence it took to get that tremendous score and i'm not taking anything away from uh you know what it takes to get a score like that it doesn't necessarily mean that it translates one for one into someone who's just going to crush uh, an associate role. Thank you for sharing that. So it sounds to me like Berkshire's building infrastructure around its business rather than having partner, everyone who just sits underneath it, and then outsourcing a lot of this process, um, whether it be talent, whether it be deal origination, it seems like you're building internal infrastructure. I mean, it's Five, four or five people in your team um, dealing with non-HR issues, uh, which is usually dumped on HR. So that is, am I right in saying that? You're basically looking at challenges the business face, hiring the right people to come and support that, training the deal team, developing and deploying um, personal development, 
professional development strategies within the organization. I'm sure that looks like in other ways as well with legal and everything else that comes with the running of an organization rather than being what I regard as a typical lean private equity firm. And I mean, a lean by headcount. Yeah, I think that's that's well said. And I'm not, you know, I'm not terribly versed in all the different ways uh, you would know better than me. Different private equity firms um, are organized. But, um, you know, I think fairly early on, we were insourcing strategic functions like legal, capital markets, portfolio support, you know, business development and, and talent. Um, and I think uh, what could have been a reaction from deal teams of like, well, wait, I, you know, I do the legal side of things. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give that to someone else to do. When you, when you bring in someone who's, you know, incredibly talented and skilled in that way, the deal person can be involved and learn, frankly, but also be involved to the extent that's useful, but it's incredibly leveraging to them to have an expert on the team advising and partnering with them. Um, I think it has worked well for us, Alex, because culturally we have enormous respect for the expertise that these functional experts are bringing to the party. So I, I think a trap that some firms run into, I've heard anyway, is a little bit of kind of a second class citizenry where the deal person is king or queen. You've got a bunch of people who are kind of um, doing other things. I, I think culturally at Berkshire, you know, and partly because it's we've hired extraordinary people, there's a real teaming and collaboration that happens and a real respect for the role that talent plays, the role that a portfolio support person plays and a view and a vision that is additive to our shared goal. You know, we are all aligned in buying great companies and supporting those companies in, in, in their growth. Um, and so that's how we, we happen to go about it. Not only am I the host of the Private Equity Podcast, but I'm also the founder and managing partner of Raw Selection. Raw Selection is a private equity specialist executive search firm with two divisions, one that focuses on portfolio C-suite executive hires and one that focuses on private equity direct hires of your back office and investment deal professionals operating across Europe and North America. A unique offering of our service is that we offer a full money back guarantee on all upfront deposits. We typically take around 10,000 US dollars as an upfront deposit to commence the search process. The remainder is then on completion, but that upfront deposit is completely refundable. If you're not happy with our service, we will refund that upfront deposit, no questions asked. So your role's somewhat unique. I mean, with regards to having somebody who's not dealing with HR and dealing with everything else, there is firms that are adopting, you know, this infrastructure model of having people like you in the organization, but most don't have it. Why why did why did Berkshire decide to bring in an individual, firstly without any talent experience? Um, but I think that you've explained that with regards to your model. But you've brought in you've brought into this organization not focusing on the portfolio focusing on internal talent and not both. There's only a handful of firms that I know have done that. What drove Berkshire to do that and and also drove them to, to appoint that role in the first place and, and why have they done this? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. Maybe someday you could uh, invite the founders of our firm onto your podcast and they can they can talk about it. Because I really do think the roots of it go back to the origination of the firm, Alex, which were five equal partners, no single name on the door, really looking to build a firm that would that they could steward for a period of time and that would kind of outlive and outlast them. Um, and I think really early on, this group recognized that what we have is talent and what we have is the quality of our people and how we deploy them to their highest and best use, how they team well together, how we make uh, investment decisions together and in a truth-seeking fashion and all of that. Um, and then they were wise because one of the investing partners who I mentioned, Jane Brock Wilson, who just is naturally exceptionally talented on the talent side of things 
ended up migrating into when she was a partner ma- migrating into a talent largely sort of talent focused role um as a as a member of the deal staff and so we very early on had around our partnership table and it was a pretty small table at the time a person who was focused on our talent and had a a seat at the table on strategic business matters with a talent lens and so I got very fortunate in a way of stepping into the seat with Jane. I was, I really, Jane taught me what mentorship really looks like. And believe me, I, I needed a lot of mentorship coming into this seat, Alex, because I, you know, as I was clear, I had never done this job before and, and God bless Jane for what she had to do to get me up a learning curve. But I really learned what mentorship was, which is having a sponsor tuck you under their wing and not only teach you the ropes of the job, but teach you everything else that's in the subtext of what's going on, the, the meeting after the meeting, so to speak. So, you know, you, you go to the, we all know this, you go to the meeting and when you're new, you don't know all the dynamics that are going on in that meeting to you. It's just a meeting where there's information being shared. It really took Jane being like, okay, let me tell you why that just went down the way it went down you know, and kind of really taking the time to teach me the nuances of people and their motivators and teaming and how people are together. So um, I I can't say what gave uh, the firm the courage or the stupidity, frankly, to hire somebody who had never done the job before. Um, I've been here 12 years, so so far it seems to be working out okay. Um, But I can say it's a firm that has always seen talent as a competitive advantage and invested behind it. Naturally, I would obviously agree with that. And I believe, I don't know who said the quote, I shouldn't really find out, but 95% of all business problems are talent problems in disguise. So definitely getting the right people in the right seats is uh, is certainly the right approach. And of course, we welcome your founders, welcome Jane, I think you said her name was, uh, to come onto the podcast as well. And, uh, and tell us how the hell she dropped her ego aside, as most would say, moved from a deal role as a partner in a firm to move to a talent role in a private equity firm. I'd never heard of that, uh, but sounds like she's incredibly passionate about it. Um, and I say that with a level of jest with regards to the ego, but I'm sure most would see that as a step down in their career. Right. Well, well, to be clear, she kept both she kept both hats going for a period of time. Uh, you know, so. Two uh, she really kept both. Uh, she really was a respected investor at the same time that she was a respected talent person. I was the first person who came in who clearly was not an investor, had no desire to be an investor, and really was 100% focused in talent. So it was sort of a migration uh, in that way, Alex. Perfectly. Thank you for explaining that. So, Sam, as much as I could talk about talent all day, if you could tell us what are your influences, what do you read? What do you watch? What do you listen to? You'd recommend our listeners check out. Um, well, I, I do read um, broadly. The first the first thing I would recommend, so it's not a specific recommendation, Alex, but um, is just to get out there and talk who are outside of your industry in talent. So I do kind of a pilgrimage every year to the West Coast. And uh, again, for some reason, people take my phone call and are gracious with their time in speaking to talent people at, you know, Facebook and Google and learning and development people at these different places. And you really, I am really trying to learn about what's happening. Where's the innovation happening in talent? What can we bring back to our little world of private equity um, that's relevant? Um, I do love the book, Crucial Conversations. Um, I think that's a really, I I think having, um, difficult, what can feel like difficult dialogues well is just critical for excellence and talent to that end, Kim Scott, uh, radical candor. Um, even if you just, um, understand that framework, um, of, of direct and kind, kind of the two, the two vectors of being kind and direct at the same time. I think that's a very powerful framework to bring into organizations. Um, you know, I also, uh, uh, enjoy unwinding with just nonfiction and Netflix and, and things of that nature. So it's not all, all talent for me all the time, Alex. 
yeah, crucial conversation that looks to the to the right. It's on my uh, reading to do list. And uh, um, uh, Kim Scott's radical candor is actually one of our values in the business, and it's something mm-hmm. we continually hammer home. So uh, two very good recommend. Well, one very good recommendation. One I will find out when I've read it is a very good recommendation. If anybody wishes to reach out, Sam, and uh, uh, get in touch with you, how best to do that, please? Yeah, shoot me an email. S. Adams at BerkshirePartners.com. Love to love to connect. Perfect. We'll put that in the in the show notes. Well, Sam, anybody who comes on and talks about talent, um, I have to hold back from talking, and hopefully I've done uh, let you do all the talking and me do very little. But thank you very much for coming on. I've learned an absolute ton. I think you know certainly a lot of value that's shared here, and I'm absolutely excited to uh, to get this podcast out and get it shared uh, with the world. So thank you very much for coming on and giving us an insight into Berkshire and what you guys are doing. Thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. And as always, to all of our listeners, thank you very much for joining us. Should you ever need support with private equity professional hiring or portfolio executive hiring, please do reach out to us. We operate across Europe and North America. If you've not already, please do subscribe to the podcast. You'll be notified of the next one that comes out every single week. But till the next time, keep smashing it. And thank you very much for listening.